I have a ton of slides. We better get started because I know you all want to hear from the Olas as well. I first want to establish what I mean by scaling. Uh, it's used a lot of ways. Uh, some people, if you have reptiles or snakes, you think differently about scaling. But uh, here we're talking actually about scaling computation. And there's horizontal and vertical scaling. Vertical typically relates to scaling up, getting more memory, getting a bigger box. And for a lot of people, that's exactly what they should do. Just get a bigger box. Don't try to buy more machines. Get a bigger machine, more RAM, and you'll be better off than messing with distributed APIs in most cases. But the world's a big place, and we all know the problems are keep getting bigger. And no matter how big of a box we get, there'll be a problem I want to solve that's even bigger. I guarantee you that. So scaling out becomes an important one as well. Horizontal scaling, typically, I want to add more nodes to my system and get computation out of it. I've got more memory. Petabyte scale, today, you usually have to have more than one node. At terabyte scale, you really can't get away with one. Uh, we've got a nice box, $17,000 we found on, no, it was on eBay. I don't know if you have something similar here in Israel, but we found a $17,000 box, terabyte of memory, and uh, 48 cores. You can do a lot of scale up computation on that kind of machine. So I'm here to talk about scaling up and out the scientific ecosystems. This diagram was built by a friend of mine, Jake Vanderplas, who's a professor at the University of Washington, who's given a lot of great talks, written a lot of great blogs about this ecosystem. I've had the pleasure of being a part of this for about 15 years. I've been a Python enthusiast since 1997, so for a long, long time, actually. <laughs> I'm feeling older every day. But I spent the first 15 years trying to build this foundation, SciPy, NumPy, and even contributing a little bit to the Python core language to try to help improve the way array computation could be done with the syntax. I plan to spend the next 15 years ensuring this ecosystem can basically scale both up and out. Uh, although previously I was spent a lot more time as a developer, a developer myself and an engineer, a lot of time in code, a lot of time with the Python C API, a lot of time deep in the trenches. I suspect over the next 15 years I'll spend more time, I've been an entrepreneur, an evangelist, and an innovator sort of of ideas and pushing people to implement those ideas and iterating with them. So that's kind of what I've been doing for the past little while and I expect to keep doing that as long as I can. Some of the things we've been working on at uh, Continuum since we started in 2012, Conda, Numba, Das, Dyn, Blaze, and this new thing called the Data Fabric. I'm not gonna talk about all of those things. We'd be here for about three hours. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about Bla excuse me, Dask and Numba. Those are two projects that I think everybody should be aware of as how they can help you, even if you're not familiar with the scientific stack. So in 2012, we took off. We blasted off in this effort in the form, uh, to form this foundation of a scalable Python. Uh, Numba, scale up, and Blaze, scale out, were kind of our initial orientations to this problem. And we started those two projects in 2012. In early 2013, uh, I, had a, I have a lot of love for the NumPy and SciPy projects. I started SciPy as a graduate student, and NumPy I wrote as a professor in 2006. Uh, but fortunately, a big community rallied around those projects. In 2013, I retired from kind of maintaining and being heavily involved in uh, NumPy. And in SciPy, I had kind of drifted from the main contribution since about 2011. And so those projects are really run by a competent group of people. So nothing I say should ever be construed as saying something about the future of NumPy or SciPy. I don't don't speak for those projects. I, I have opinions. I'm a contributor member, community member like everybody else. I did, I did spend a lot of time writing those projects, but uh, they are now in true open source fashion being run by a community. It's awesome, fantastic. So I do, however, care about array-oriented computing and how to scale up these computations, and so I'm off trying to innovate in other areas. So in, we basically, I've been focusing on the next generation. How do we do array computing with more machines, with GPU computing? It's not much such a single library, but a new emphasis. So to do it, there's been a lot of effort around not just, okay, I'm gonna go in my hole and try to write some code, but also let's rally a community. Uh, NumFocus is basically a community that we established in 2012. It's an Apache for open data science. R Open and NumPy and Jupyter Project, they're all projects that are uh, sponsored by NumFocus. If you haven't heard about NumFocus, look it up. It's something that helps promote the PyData conference series that happens everywhere around the world. I expect there'll be a PyData Israel probably soon. There's a few folks probably interested in that. And hopefully more people get interested even after this conference. I also organized a company in Continuum Analytics. Our purpose is to empower people to solve the world's greatest challenges. We do that every day. We want to keep doing that as long as we can. And then we started working on key technology uh, with some sponsorship from DARPA, the XData program, and uh, other uh, companies who helped us. We've been working hard on several key technologies. And I'm going to talk today about Numba and Dask and how they help scale up and scale out respectively. We were bootstrapped. 
self-funded and a little bit of friends, family, and fools capital, as they say, the three Fs, um, kind of kept working hard, getting various, working for projects, doing client work, and in spare time, and even not spare time, spent a lot of time building open source technology and making it available to everybody to try to figure out how to really grow these uh, scale out and scale up uh, scientific ecosystem. Did receive VC funding in 2015, and that's only hastened the stress as opposed to hastened the growth. A lot, of, a lot of growth, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of things we're doing. But I'm here basically to talk about a milestone success in 2016. We really basically, if you think about colonizing the outer planets as our goal, or going to the stars as our goal, then uh, we've reached the moon, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, Numba is delivering on the scaling out promise, and Dask is delivering on scaling up. We have actually been able to, with Dask Array, Dask Data Frame, you can have a scaled out array and data frame experience today with these tools. Now here's just a simple example, I don't know if it shows up great there, but with Numba and Dask together, you can do some amazing thing. Uh, we have also a visualization tool called Bokeh, which you really should check out. I'm not gonna be able to talk about it, but it's a beautiful tool for building web visualizations. Here's an example, we decouple data processing and, and with visualization, there's a data shader library that uses both Dask and Numba, and can render three billion GPS coordinates in less than, a, less than a second on several Amazon machines. Basically using these tools, it's phenomenal. It's actually um, a lot better than most things I've ever seen. I haven't seen anything do it to this scale. It's amazing what you can do when you kind of bring together these technologies, and you can do it with fairly straightforward Python code. This doesn't require reams and reams of C++ and things you can't follow. It's actually, here's a fairly straightforward transformation show the result on screen, and, and, and boom, it shows up. Even on your MacBook, it only takes a minute on a standard MacBook to render these three billion points in a visually perceptive way. Here's another example that just does the, the 300 million points, so factor of 10 less. Uh, should be simple, and it, and it is. It really, you can do this interactively, and you can, what it means is no tile rendering. You have all the data you're seeing, and you're rendering it, and you can zoom in and zoom out and look for, there's, this in, data set's very interesting because you can look at the different cities, and you can see, oh, there's, there's a racial division there, or there's where some problems might show up here. It's, cut, it's showing the ability to visualize categorical data. So all this is to just try to get your mind oriented to the kinds of problems you can do once you have the ability to scale up and scale out with ease. Anaconda is the easiest way to get this. So that's why I talk about it. It's free, it's uh, available at our website. It's the leading open data science platform. It's powered by Python, which we th is the fastest growing open data science language. We're all fans here, but there's a lot of other ways to do data science, and Python is becoming rapidly the, the de facto way. So Anaconda, many of you may not may be aware, or maybe you're not aware, that Intel has some fast libraries called MKL. Uh, we actually have a partnership with Intel that lets us distribute the MKL libraries to you for free, and you can actually redistribute them because Anaconda itself is BSD licensed, so those binaries are now available for anybody to ship uh, with, as part of their Anaconda-based application. So that's very exciting, and these provide optimal LAPAC, FFT, kind of low-level um, implementations that Intel has, has made fast. One way to make things faster is don't reinvent the wheel. Go and find somebody you can partner with and use a library that works well. Um, I show this because it's very exciting, the kinds of tools that are now possible with Python. Many people may be familiar with the Hadoop ecosystem and with Spark. Uh, basically, with, with Dask and Numba uh, kind of together and the ability to scale, we've added the ability to directly talk to HDFS and Yarn through libraries that are public and open source and freely available. And now you can talk directly to HDFS data with Python. You Anaconda and the Python stack essentially becomes an execution framework just like Spark just like everything else in the Hadoop ecosystems. All your data on Hadoop clusters is now available to Python. And the whole spectrum, if you don't like to use Dask, you want to use some MPI things strung together with IPython Parallel, knock yourself out. Awesome, you can do, that's why I say Anaconda is kind of the execution framework. Dask is powerful, but you know, the Python ecosystem is full of creative geniuses, and there's all kinds of things you can do, and now it's available. And kind of there's this push to put big data in big distributed file systems. And there was previously this little straw you had to blow through called the Hadoop Java JVM. Um, even with Spark, it's still a little straw. And now you basically have the whole machine, all the native uh, code that is linked and glued together with Python available to you in the data science world. So I'm very excited about this. I'd like to, you know, people should know about this and start to play with it, learn about it, use it. Uh, I think we've found that with array and table-oriented computing problems, 10 to 100x faster than Spark. 
and Spark is already so much faster than MapReduce, that's why it's so popular, but this, is, this blows it out of the water when you're doing array computation. And we'll show maybe a couple of examples later. You could always use Python to talk to the JVM and to the Hadoop stack from a, from a side. That's always been possible, as shown at the top of this slide. Always possible, still possible. That's one beautiful thing about Python. It interacts and glues and plays with everything. So that's why we love it so much. We just go at a little bit lower level. So when I talk about Numba, Numba is the first key to scaling out, and that, scaling up, excuse me, and that's what uh, some of you have seen some of these slides. I'm gonna go fairly quickly. Uh, just want to make sure everyone's level set on what we mean by Numba. Numba is a compiler of a subset of the Python uh, language. So it's a, the subset that includes array and scalar computation. So if you're writing NumPy-like or Pandas-like code, Numba makes it easy to make that fast. You don't have to turn to C++, you don't even have to turn to Cython. And the reason it makes it work is because we didn't really have to do a whole lot. Here's a typical compiler. Translate your language to an intermediate representation, and then that goes to the to the, uh, either the GPU or the CPU. And we just replaced kind of the C++ layer, put Python as the code, and then talked to LLVM, which is the code generator of the intermediate language. So it's fairly straightforward. That's why it's fairly simple. And doing that, you can basically take Python code and get machine code out of it with a simple decorator. So decorators are things that take functions and return other things, and so you can take that function and return machine code. Uh, as long as you can figure out what the types are. And that's kind of the magic. So how does it work? Well, first of all, uh, it works really well, and you can write code. You can write image processing code in Python syntax. So you write something that looks like a four, nest, a nested, four nested for loops. And it works as if you wrote that in C or Fortran. And the 1500x speed up over just the raw C Python. We'll see some other examples of that. It works by um, the simple case is just to say JIT as a decorator on your function, and then what that produces is a function waiting to get called. And once it's called, it then discovers what you're calling it with, and that starts the type inference. And there's, here's the function arguments, and I have all the code, and I know those function arguments, and therefore I know how they're used and combined, and I can, most of the time, well, at least if you write a certain subset of Python, if I can try to infer the types. And once it infers the types, then it can translate, instead of using the interpreter, it can go strictly the machine code with that type information. Rewrites the IR, there's some lowering steps, you could LLVM IR, and out comes machine code, and that machine code's cached. So with, a, you know, very repeatedly, you can get very, very fast code by calling a function with certain kinds of variables. Now, it doesn't handle, if you're just, if you have a very complex structure of lists and dictionaries and maps and trees, and you're just really using the dynamic nature of Python, this isn't gonna help you. And so you're just gonna basically get uh, the interpreter will get out of the way, but you're still going to go through all those objects, and it won't be faster. It's only faster if you can really understand the types in terms of their low level of representations. But the nice thing is this supports Windows and OS 10 and Linux, and there's no doesn't use your compiler. It is the compiler, so out of the box, you just install Numba and JIT functions, and they can become very fast. You end up with there's two modes. You really want to get to no Python mode for the speed. Object mode is just in, to keep it running and doesn't error if you can't find a compilation strategy. Sometimes you want to error instead, and so there's this no Python equals true mode, so that it'll raise an error instead of just keep going. So how do you use Numba? Create a realistic benchmark. This is really intended for hotspot profiling. It's not intended that you take your whole code and run it through Numba. Maybe at some point it'll get there, but right now it's really intended for, hey, here's, I'm trying to do this, and this is where my hotspot is, let me see if I can compile this down to machine code, instead of writing a stanchion module or writing something else, which has been very common in the scientific stack, to write Cython code or write an extension module. Now Numba gives you the ability not to do that. So there's two interfaces, JIT and Vectorize. I really love Vectorize, I'll show you a bit later why, because it really was the impetus for why Numba got written. Um, but the basics are you just, here's an example of a simple function. Notice that NumPy syntax is supported, so even though you're calling NumPy empty-like, it doesn't actually use NumPy, it sort of implements it with machine code, kind of the equivalent, and you're just using the syntax. Uh, notice uh, you don't have to say the no Python equals true. If you do, then it raises an error if it can't find all the types and lower everything to machine code. If you're left with the Python interpreter still, you get an error. Sometimes you want to know that you're not going to be faster. Notice you can loop over an ND array as an iterator. It's standard Python. You can use the NumPy math functions. You can use regular, you can use plus equals. You can write relatively Pythonic code and return a slice of the array, and then that all gets compiled down to machine code. It's a, a very powerful system that you can actually get faster than NumPy performance out of even today. 
You also can call other functions. So if my JIT function calls another function that was also JITted, it doesn't go through the Python layer. It's actually just calling this, this call stack on the binary level. And in fact, it'll inline that. LLVM will inline some of those simple functions. So you can get really, really fast performance just writing high-level Python code by JITting. So it, it kind of lets you think, oh, I can just write an if statement here. I can do a for loop here. I can just do simple kind of algorithms and prototype them in Python and kind of and then get, know I'm going to get the speed out of them when I compile and JIT. And so very, very quickly, you can get a lot faster implementations than uh, even NumPy. I really like NumPy because it lets you build ufunks. So that's something I wanted forever. So a ufunk, just to kind of level set those who may not be familiar, ufunks and generalized ufunks, or gufunks as they're called, they operate element-wise or subarray-wise across an array without an explicit loop. So it's like a map across a list, except you uh, give it that a kernel function. Can't previously couldn't be written in Python. That kernel, the thing that gave the speed to NumPy, had to be written in a compiled code. Had to be written in C or had to be written in some extension language. And that was painful. That implicit loop was necessary to give NumPy all its speed, but it was painful to write because you had to write this boilerplate C code. In fact, nobody ever wrote them. I think I was the one that wrote most ufunks. Uh, Numeric had them, and then I wrote a ton for a, something called Sci-Fi Special, learned about the ufunks, documented the ufunks. My first contribution to open source was a chapter in the Numeric book in 1999 about ufunks. And so I always wanted since then, just, oh, gosh, can we write them in Python? Because it's so painful to write them in C. And I've always wanted that. But to do it, we had to write a compiler. So with Numba, we can finally do it. And you can write ufunks with Numba. That means you can write the kernel. And the kernel is just something that operates on a single element of the array. And then notice here this game wins function. All those arguments, you can think that they're scalars. So they're just variable, there's integers or floating point values. And then when this is called down here in, uh, in line 21, it's going to be called with a vector. This sim input is a big old array of inputs. Notice I'm calling the same function game wins, but now I'm, I'm defining it as a scalar, what to do with every scalar, but I'm calling it on an array. So that implicit loop is built in to the ufunk and I get all the answers really quickly. And it's down at machine level code. So it's the fastest way to sort of write code that can then be parallelized. Um, here's a simple example kind of showing what I missed by not having something like this earlier on. So 16 years ago, if this had existed, then I wouldn't have had to go to CFIs and try to figure out how to link this Fortran library against a C library to do the Bessel function. I, so one day I just took, and the, took the low-level C code and translated it back into Python. And basically there's a bunch of defined array constants and then a very simple uh, PADE approximation, which is a rational function, small um, order polynomial in the numerator denominator. You estimate, and then it's sort of a check to see which range you're in, and then it does different PADE approximates depending on which range you're in of, of the argument. That's the algorithm. It's fairly straightforward to write in Python. So I could write it in Python, vectorize it with Numba, and get a machine code implementation, run it, and that machine code implementation was just a little bit even faster than the SciPy code that called the original function. But now it's in Python, and now I can modify it, understand it. You don't have to hand it over to somebody who doesn't know how to read C, they don't know what it's doing, they can understand the code much simpler. The previous code would not have fit on a single page, I, but I could do it with the Python code even with two different versions of the polynomial evaluation, one with a single, with a unit constant for the first variable, and one with a, a variable constant. But now the advantage is Numba can take that and run it on the accelerator. So um, that's a huge deal for a lot of people. It's very popular now, lots of people can use it. You can release the gill with it. So a lot of people talk about, oh, I can't scale out Python because it's got the gill. And I just laugh at them and say, no, it's fine. Sure, Python's great. But Python gives me a gill, so I can at least know I don't have race conditions when I'm running it. It's a place I can know I've got, I'm not having multiple threads run at the same time. But I can call out to machine code that I've generated from my Python and have it run on multiple threads. And I can build powerful systems this way. It's as simple as saying no gill equals true on my jitted function. Um, you can also program a GPU. There's a CUDA JIT, I'm not gonna go into detail, but if you know something about the CUDA concept and how you can actually run multiple cores, you can build kernels that then scale across the GPU, and it's the easiest way to program a GPU I know about. So here's a simple example, kind of bringing it all together, the, the classic Mandelbrot set, showing with CPython, maybe a 1x, with NumPy array operations, you get 13x improvement. If you use Numba, do the CPU, uh, you kind of minimize some memory overhead, and you get 120x speed up, and then using the NVIDIA Tesla card with uh, CUDA JIT, 
2000x speed up over the original C Python. So it shows with staying in Python syntax, you can get 2000x speed ups on your code uh, for appropriately built uh, programs. Debugging's hard. You have to use debug in Python. The whole goal is debug in Python and get from there. There's a CUDA simulator. Not everything works. It's not a perfect uh, set, but a lot of things are working. Sets and tuples do work. Um, List and dictionary comprehensions don't. Closure inside a JIT function, yield from. We can go into more detail, but the, it keeps getting better and better. There's something called JIT classes. You can define higher, higher order abstractions, and those compile. Support for dot operations, linear algebra operations. Ahead of time compilations, you can ship your code to somebody that doesn't have Numba. You can pre-compile pre it, and now they can just have binary code that they're running. And disk caching. So that's just a whirlwind tour through kind of some of the, so Numba and how it lets you scale up. I want to spend a little more time uh, on Dask, because many of you may not have heard of Dask before. It's relatively new, newer than Numba. Numba's been worked on since 2012. Dask really started in 2014, end of 2014, and the distributed engine really was the last, uh, last September, last August, when it first came out. So before we talk about scaling out, remember, don't just run off and scale out everything. First, see if you can find a better algorithm, speed up your code first. There's a lot of things. It's a pain to do distributed algorithms no matter what tool you have. So first, make sure you really need to scale out. Otherwise, you'll, save your, otherwise you'll have pain you don't need to have. So what is Dask? Dask is a Python parallel computing library. It's familiar. It implements parallel NumPy and Pandas objects. So it's familiar if you know what NumPy and Pandas are. Uh, it's fast. It's optimized for numerical uh, applications. It's very flexible for sophisticated and messy algorithms. It does scale up, runs resiliently on clusters of hundreds of nodes, and it scales down. It's pragmatic enough to run on a single laptop with four or five cores or 12 cores, and it's interactive. It gives people the experience of doing NumPy and Pandas interactivity, but on a terabyte of data or even a petabyte of data scaled across 100 nodes. So it gives you that kind of feeling of, I'm just dealing with data on memory, but now the, the memory's all over. It complements the rest of the Anaconda stack, the rest of the PyData stack. It was definitely developed with NumPy and Pandas users in mind. So um, spectrum of parallelization, you've got implicit control, very easy, but, and then explicit control, which is fastest but hard, and you have a lot of MPI, zero MQ, sort of raw socket programming down there. Dask is just below kind of the spark. It's still easy to use, but gives you more control. So um, that's one of the differences. The big key of Dask is it separates out collections, graphs, and schedulers into their own separate bins. And so you can use the graphs of Dask independent of the collections. If you never want to program a Dask array or a data frame or a bag or any of the others, so you don't have to. You can just deal with the graph. You can also replace the graph with a scheduler of your choice. There are built-in reference schedulers for multiprocessing, multithreading, and distributed. And they come out of the box and they work, but you can substitute your own because the graph specification is very straightforward. The Dask collections give you, that's where the magic is. That's where you can do distributed array computing. It's where you have a NumPy scaled out with a Dask array. Uh, the Dask data frame gives you group by capabilities that scale across multiple nodes. The Dask bag is the closest thing to a Spark RDD. It's a list, basically. It's a collection of data scaled across a bunch of nodes, a resilient uh, RDD um, similar. And then the imperative is a unique thing about Dask. It's kind of a Pythonic aspect of Dask. It gives you a way to talk about a delayed operation. There's really, a, it's delayed, Dask.delayed. You can wrap a function, and then it doesn't do that function immediately. It sticks it in the graph, ready to be called at a later time. Graphs are just simply expressions of the tasks that need to be performed. The simplest way to get a task, here's an example of a machine learning pipeline that you might run. Just shows all the different components that need to run. If you think about parallel computing, it's basically on a bunch of machines that got to run individual tasks in a specific order. And, the depend and certain, certain outputs are dependent um, before I can run later uh, downstream uh, functions. And the graph expresses what those are. These graphs, you have uh, functions are the boxes and the data is the circles. Here's even, I think it doesn't show up very well, but as I, I add a grid search to my machine learning pipeline, then I have an embarrassingly parallel problem and I have a fairly complex graph but now it's run in parallel, and Dask can handle this very straightforwardly. Here's a simple example of taking an array expression, a plus one times two raised to the third power. Now that's adding one to every element of the array. That's multiplying every element of the array by two, and then multiplying and taking the power of three. So what Dask does is it chunks that up and separates it into not one operation, but many operations based on the chunk size. And, that's, and then automatically the scheduler will split that across the nodes, execute them behind the scenes, and you as the user just feel like, hey, I'm running an NumPy expression, this is cool. But you're using 
dozens to hundreds of nodes, um, all in memory uh, or writing to disk, kind of depending on how you've set up the computation. If you're more complicated, you can do simple things like taking the mean, do a transpose, standard deviation, the graph is expressed. The key to making Dask work at scale is the scheduler. And there's several schedulers I've told you about, but this is the distributed scheduler. We have a scheduler talking to multiple workers. The workers communicate with each other. And you have the scheduler takes a part of the graph, starts to execute it, and it has internal uh, state to know who has what data, and therefore where should the next uh, computation be sent, so that the computation is sent to where the data sits. instead of. And there's an ad hoc minimization of data movement, because that's one of the things that slows down parallel computation the most, is moving data around. So that lets you. If you have a simple uh, cluster client machine talking to a head node where the scheduler might run a bunch of worker nodes, you can run Dask on this system pretty straightforwardly. There's a lot of ways to get it started. Either SSH into the cluster and run dscheduler. Dcluster will basically run a scheduler and workers on the whole cluster. Or you can specifically call workers on the different nodes and call dscheduler on another one. There's resource integration with certain resource management tools like Yarn. There's a project called Knit that does that, or SGE or Slurm. On the cloud, there's a project called Deck2. You can quickly get started with a bunch of Amazon nodes and get Dask running on them all. Um, it's got Dask EC2 is what Deck2 means. So it's an easy way just to you know, pay a lot of money to Amazon because you spin up a bunch of nodes pretty quickly and you can use them quite a long time if you're not careful. Um, definitely have to watch our Amazon budget since we've been playing with this. And then we also have a product called Anaconda Cluster that lets you do it for an enterprise. There's a great visualization, schedule visualization with Bokeh. Uh, if you haven't checked out Bokeh, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, our de the developer that wrote Dask was able to build the Bokeh application because it provides a way to build web applications for non-web programmers. You just have to know how to kind of understand Python code, and you can build a web app pretty quickly. So um, that's what he did with the scheduler, and it's now it's a nice scheduler tool that can see all that's happening on your, on your cluster. And that comes out of the box with Dask as well. So the kinds of things you can do with Dask, this is just a sampling of the kinds of things you do to kind of illustrate what you might do with the data frame, or with the bag, or with the array, or with the basically delayed operation, each one. So very quickly, here's an example using Dask data frames on a cluster with CSV data, the New York City taxi data. And it illustrates how Dask is able to take advantage of the PyData stack. It doesn't reinvent pandas, it uses pandas, and just takes each piece of it and Dask is just scheduling pandas operations across the cluster. So very quickly, we can leverage the entire PyData stack instead of having to reinvent it like other kinds of parallel frameworks have to do, and they're way behind. So we're able to take advantage of where we are in the Python ecosystem and go even faster. Uh, there's tools to access with low latency HDFS3 data as well as S3, F, as S3 data. And kind of you can think of as a programmer that entire data frame as one logical data frame, even though it exists separately on individual boxes behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about that. It handles it for you. Here's another example of how you might use, um, use text data stored in a Dask bag. So it's spread out across a bunch of machines, these text data. How do you build a list that's uh, you know, three billion elements long and has to, it doesn't fit in memory? Dask lets you do that, build a logical list that's that big, and then you can write expressions on it, kind of with the tools and mapping kind of expressions, traditional map reduce, and run non, uh, the NLTK or other text analysis programs on it. This, this is what looks the most closely like Spark or typical Hadoop processing. The Dask array and the Dask data frame are kind of jumped ahead of where those tools are. This is, the Dask bag is there as kind of, this is what the state of the art is in the other frameworks, but we've kind of moved ahead because of our, uh, speed of our lead in the PyData stack with NumPy and Pandas and the whole scikit-learn tools already existing. So with this, Python is in great shape. It's in much better shape, in fact, than a lot of the other tools. It's just it's going to take some time for people to be aware of it. Some of those other tools have been around for two or three years, and people have gotten used to them and started to use them. So I encourage you, if you're playing with Spark, if you're looking at Spark, and you're a Python user, as most of you should be if you're in this conference, <laughs> take a look at DAS, because I, I suspect it'll save you some pain, and it'll be um, it's more Pythonic, and the developers are a eager and anxious for your feedback. And so you may find that you can actually nerd swipe somebody and get them to work on your stuff uh, directly, <laughs> um, as, as can happen when a project is younger. So there's lots of people who are jumping on, the, the scikit-learn, the x-ray guys, the, lots of people using this now from the scientific stack. Here's an example, if you want to use DAS to represent this logical array that exists across multiple nodes, and so you've, you've chunked up NumPy arrays, and your operations are, again, using NumPy. It's not reinventing it, it's using NumPy. 
And you can write very, very complex algorithms this way and solve these sort of large-scale climatology problems that sometimes show up. Now, you know, programming in parallel, you know, this, it's actually pretty magical until it isn't. There's still some big problems sometimes with trying to do things at scale. I mean, computers don't get the data they need. They have to talk to something they don't have. It can delay for some strange reason. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I'm very hopeful and optimistic about this technology, but it is, you know, still about a year old. So uh, please do, if you find issues, come, you know, uh, get on the mailing list, talk about them, see if there may be a missing feature, there may be something that's not there yet. You know, join in the, in the conversation to try to make these things even better. Um, so, but they do work to do a lot of things. We've been, show, we've been using them to do a lot of things and improving them constantly. This is the one that a lot of Python programmers will find it just sort of blows the socks off of other approaches because it gives you kind of the full power of Python to just add to your Dask array and bag and uh, the data frame kind of give you methods that are fairly controlled, which is nice if you don't know what you're, if you kind of want something easy to get into the system with. But the delayed lets you write arbitrary Python and then just add it to the DAG, add it to the distributed acyclic graph of computation to perform. So it's very quickly you can build some sophisticated tools that use the same infrastructure to get the results you want. This can be a real lifesaver when the built-in tools aren't, aren't flexible enough. So it lets you combine features from DAS data frames and arrays into one big system. And the scheduler then provides resilient and elastic execution. So you can kill nodes, kill workers, and the scheduler will send workers to the others. You can add workers mid-flight, so if you realize it's not getting done, you add another node and it starts to take uh, some of the tasks. So it's, it's a very flexible system. So that's what I want to get across, is that uh, you know, we've landed. <laughs> we do have scaled out Pi data like we sort of wanted to do in 2012. It's very exciting, right? There's a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of step fits and starts. Uh, we started with Blaze as the out of core kind of scaled out uh, Pi data stack. Blaze is still existing. It's now becoming an interface to DAS, to Spark, to lots of systems, and it's still continuing. And so there's lots more to do. It's a still an exciting place to get, impo get involved. And as we colonize the outer planets, uh, jump in and get involved. Uh, there's plenty of places to dive in. And even the work you're doing in Python, no matter what it is you're doing, benefits this work because we benefit from all the great innovations that happen in the Python space generally. At th the question is, at the PyData workshop, do you have really complicated, messy things you can bite into? Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with what workshop you're referring to. Is this something that's... The future oh, sure. If you go to a PyData event or a tutorial, or a, uh, yeah, there's examples all the time of, I mean, how it depends on what your data is, whether it's messy or not. But, you know, a lot of the data is you have to do various steps to get it to the state you want, and then you can, but you get real results. You get real, real, real solutions. Uh, but, yeah, your mileage may vary. I mean, the question is, is there any special configuration on the nodes that needs to be addressed or dependencies? Um, DAS does have some dependencies on Tornado and a few other things like that, but nothing that's not hard to install. Nothing that's easy, not easy to install. Everything's very installable. I mean, that's, well, we actually provided Conda when we first started so that guarantee you everything's easy to install. Uh, so yeah, everything is, uh, you can put it on any box. There's no prior need to have anything. It's, it, it, you know, you, depending on your approach, we can talk about it and I can show you how we find it's easy to install. Yeah, there's an example at GTC actually with NVIDIA. The question was, does Dask interoperate with Numba? Um, you know, there's work that's ongoing. Sometimes we've, we've, we've had lots of examples of using Numba on every one of the nodes to compile down. And there's been some changes to Numba to make sure that the pickling, you know, the pickling interface is working. And there's subtle little changes that had to occur. But yeah, there's multiple examples showing even taking a cluster of GPUs and running them. There's actually a talk we gave at the uh, NVIDIA conference. They accepted it because it had the word Spark in it. Uh, we said Spark with GPUs. And we ended up just using Spark to call Dask. <laughs> Didn't really need Spark, but was there. And actually, it illustrated a, a possible point of view. I mean, maybe you could, you, you could still do that. You can think of Dask as something you could call as part of your subnodes in, in a Spark calculation. And maybe if you have to satisfy your boss, that's another technique you can use. Hey, I'm using Spark. <laughs> but really, it's Dask underneath calling everything. But we've done that with Numba, and, and, and uh, shown they, they work well together. Um, you know, I love the PyPy Pi guys. I really, I, I love people who take on hard problems and try to solve them. Um, I, it seemed like a really hard problem to me <laughs> for PyPy Pi to solve the basic problem of making it so that all extensions of, Pi, of like the whole NumPy stack, which is all built around extensions, could work. 
Numbers approach has been not to replace the C Python interpreter, but to kind of do jitting from within, as opposed to kind of doing it from without. Um, that's sort of the fundamental difference, kind of two sides of a tunnel burrowing in on their way. Uh, I think they could share, especially with, uh, there's a lot of things that could be shared. Um, there's a library called Dyn, for example. Uh, it's a C++ library, and it could actually, you know, Numbo is going to call Dyn, and PyPy could call Dyn. If they share a common array structure, and they could share common typed information. A lot of things that could be shared between the projects, um, especially now. Uh, so I think they just sort of are trying to tunnel to the same place from different sides of the mountain. Um, they're both useful in their various regimes. One thing, so there's a use case of, so Dask is just pure Python, and it uses Tornado. So in fact, you can get, you can speed it up by using, by running Dask under PyPy, and it's even, it's faster. So it's kind of, there's a nice opportunity for PyPy to run Dask as a scheduler in this fast mode, and then have Numba compile, and kind of everything work together. So thank you, I'm glad I got a chance to speak here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.